great panel put together, um, excluding myself, <laughs> Professor Donato and Elliot Osment um, from here in Nashville. And we're going to talk about different aspects of the immigration experience um, from the time they leave their homes um, to the time they arrive in Nashville and the challenges they face once they get into Nashville. So without any further ado, I'm going to spend the first 10, uh, 15 minutes talking about um, what makes a, a person decide to leave their home, to leave their country, and make a, a oftentimes treacherous journey um, to make it to the United States and then ultimately to Nashville. And then I'll turn it over to Professor Donato, who will talk about the U.S. experience uh, once they arrive here. Okay, so um, this is kind of the outline of, of the talk, tracing the immigrant journey. Um, and so we'll move right into uh, what are referred to as push factors. Uh, what are the, the conditions that lead someone, as I said, to leave their home and make that journey? Um, and I'm going to make four points uh, in the next 10 minutes or so. First, uh, from the economic perspective, I'm going to argue that uh, it's not the poorest of the poor that are leaving. Okay, And that's a common uh, misconception among many. Um, and particularly in the media, that you will hear that, you know, that we're just being overwhelmed by, by the millions of poor people around the world. And if we open up our borders, we're just going to get overrun with the poorest of the poor. And in fact, research demonstrates that um, that's not the case. The second point is uh, to focus on what's referred to as the friends and family effect. And I'll explain that, what, what's going on with that. Uh, in a few minutes. And then finally, I'll focus on the political factors that lead someone to make that decision to leave um, and conclude with a, um, a look at kind of the challenges of what I would refer to now as a mixed, a wave of mixed migration that's happening primarily from Central America and Mexico. All right. So, uh, not the poorest of the poor. All right, what you have here is a. Um, a graph showing the percentage of respondents in, a, in surveys conducted across Latin America by Vanderbilt's own Latin American Public Opinion Project that asked the simple question, in the next three years, do you have any intentions of emigrating to another country? And you would think that even if you had the slightest inkling of leaving your home and going to another country, you would say yes. But the first takeaway from this slide should be how few people answered yes to that very simple question. Uh, you, starting from the bottom in Brazil, 8.5% said yes. Um, Mexico, 13%. Um, and then, yes, we do have Haiti, uh, where everyone wants to leave <laughs> um, for understandable reasons. Um, a couple of things about that. We are not going to get 54% of the Haitian population migrating to the U.S. anytime soon. Um, but we also aren't going to get 13% of the Mexican population. And so what this should suggest is that if it were simply the case of the poorest of the poor want to go off to another li a better life, um, more economic op opportunity, these percentages for many of these countries would be much higher, right? So there's clearly, the, the question um, perhaps is better framed as not why do people migrate, but why do so many people stay home? Okay, why do so many people say no to this very simple question? All right. Um, another kind of glimpse uh, to drive home this point. Th these are migration rates from Mexico's 31 states. Okay, and what you can see from here is that the vast majority of Mexico tends not to migrate. All right, there's a, the, the central western states that you see highlighted in blue and purple with over 10% uh, emigration rates uh, suggest that there's something about that particular area of Mexico that's driving people to migrate. That's one of the richest areas of Mexico the central western part of the country. The poorest part is down here where there's virtually no migration. That's changed somewhat over the past 10, 15 years, 
But in general, the vast majority of migrants from Mexico come from about seven states. All right? So again, it's not a simple question to answer why do people choose to leave their homes. It's not just an economic story. All right? Um, what we do know from research uh, about Mexican and Central American migrants is that they tend to be uh, relatively well educated, meaning they tend to have um, up to a high school education, which in a country where 40% of the population doesn't get past the primary school, uh, that's relatively well educated. Uh, they tend to be male and of working age, which is no surprise. Um, and they tend to come from households that have fairly steady income streams. Okay, again, these are not the poorest of the poor uh, migrating to the United States. The second point I want to make is what I refer to as the fa friends and family effect. Okay, so what is this and what do you have in front of you? This is, a, again, a map of Mexico where uh, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but those are the railroad lines that from 1920. Why is that important for understanding migration to, from Mexico today? Well, those same states that we were looking at a couple minutes ago are where the railroad lines ended up in, in 1920. And this is where U.S. recruiters um, came to recruit Mexican migrants to work in the U.S. once we kicked out the Chinese. <laughs> okay, so the moral of the story is that migration, in part, is a, is uh, you you reap what you sow. Okay, if you're going to recruit um, labor to come work in your country, um, it tends to reproduce over time. And we can trace much of what has happened in Mexico over the past 30 years to what happened in Mexico in 1920 when the U.S. went down looking for labor. Um, fast forwarding to the 40s and 50s, we had, the U.S. had what is known as the Bracero Program, where once again we were in need of labor. And so the U.S. government set up a program to actively recruit Mexicans to come work uh, primarily in the southwest part of the United States. We then have the Central American conflicts of the 1980s. Again, another source of migration from a region that we're now seeing more and more migrants come from. Um, and then finally, we, we have a, an assortment of labor recruitment programs going on today and why are all these connected to the more general pattern of migration? Because one of the strongest findings we have from research on why people decide to migrate is that if you have a friend or family member who has already migrated, and particularly one that has decided to send you remittances, that increases the probability that you yourself will migrate as well. Hence, the friends and family effect. Okay, so what started in 1920 um, is still having uh, ramifications for understanding migration today. Okay, and finally, we'll look at the, the political factors that are involved in migration today from primarily Mexico and, and Central America. Um, these are what I, so Latin America is in the midst of um, an unprecedented era of democracy. Uh, for the first time in the region's history, the vast majority of countries are democratic, albeit imperfect and illiberal, but democratic nonetheless. And so what we have taking place here is um, an opening of the political systems, but also an opening of the possibility of making a choice about whether you want to stay in this country or go somewhere else. And what's pushing more and more people to choose to leave is the imperfection or are the imperfections of Latin American democracies. And primarily, again, with Central America and Mexico as the examples, 
uh, violence is starting to play an, an increasing role in sending people abroad. Here you have the homicide rates for Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, um, all of which are classified as the, by the World Bank as situations of extreme violence. Um, and as we do more and more research on the factors that leads, lead people to decide to leave, um, being victimized by the crime and violence that's taking place in the region is um, exponentially uh, important in understanding that decision. So you see in this graph, this is a result of a multivariate regression model that controls for a, an assortment of other factors, the friends and family effect, the economic factors, and what we find as most powerful in that model is whether someone was victimized twice by crime in the previous 12 months. So you see what happens to the probability of saying yes to that immigration intentions question. Okay, so we're not certain they're leaving, but this is kind of the, the ceiling on who is thinking about leaving, right? And when you're victimized twice, that's the threshold point um, for many people to say, you know what, I got to get out of here, all right? And as we see violence continue in Central America and in parts of Mexico, we see this effect, this violence effect, um, kicking in more and more as time goes by. And finally, I'll conclude with um, some comments on what I re refer to as a mixed migration um, dynamic going on from Central America and Mexico. That is, we have a mixture of migrants who are leaving for economic reasons, but also for violence reasons, for for being, having been a victim of crime and violence. Okay, so we have mixed motives of the people that are coming to the U.S., all right? So the question is, how does U.S. policy respond to that? U.S. policy last summer, the Obama administration made a, a very clear decision that we're going to construct a policy to prevent migrants from coming from Central America that's um, built upon the assumption that they simply don't have information about how tough life is once they get here, about the slim chances that they will have of actually successfully migrating to the U.S. That is, the policy has been constructed around the notion that they're not getting the right message. Right? What these, this chart suggests is that, in fact, people in Honduras, this is a survey done in uh, 12 of the more violent municipalities in, in Honduras. And what this suggests is that virtually every respondent to the survey is getting the message the Obama administration thought they were not receiving. You can go down these bars. 85% when asked, do you think crossing the border is more difficult, less difficult, or the same as 12 months before? 85% say it's more difficult. And this is in August of 2014, right as the crisis was reaching um, its peak along the border. Um, when asked, do you think the border is less safe or more safe or the same? 83% say less safe. Deportations have increased. 79% say yes, they've increased. Um, migrants are treated worse. 65%. And then this, uh, this one bar heard the Permiso rumor. This was a big, this made headlines too, that they were just, they heard this rumor about you can get a Permiso and get over the border and that's why everyone was coming. Well, it is, the, it is true that most people had heard the Permiso rumor, but this was in the context of a widespread U.S. campaign in Central America, a public relations campaign, um, referred to as the Dangerous Awareness Campaign, to make clear to all Central Americans that the Permiso rumor was not true. Okay, so they had heard the Permiso rumor, but all of these other bars suggest that they knew it wasn't true. Why do I highlight this to conclude? Because they are receiving the message, but they're still coming. In that model I showed you where violence was such a strong predictor, of saying yes to the migration question, none of these were significant. None of these mattered with respect to whether somebody would respond yes to immigration intentions. 
Okay, so that suggests that you can tell them as many ways as possible how dangerous it is to migrate, but in a context of mixed migration, they're still going to come. All right, I'll hand it over to Professor Donato, who will talk to you about migration in the U.S. Okay, so um, he forgot to set the timer. So, uh, okay, I'm going to try to set the timer. Um, all right, so what is migration? I thought that um, just quickly we should go over some terms so that we're all on the same page. Um, there are a lot of terms here. There's immigration, there's emigration with an E, there's migration. So think about immigration as people entering in, in migration, okay? So people who are in the U.S., who are living here but born elsewhere are immigrants. Emigrants are people who leave. In the United States, many uh, people who are U.S. born leave as they retire to, and move to other countries. This is sort of a, a, a trend now that we're seeing in the data. Those are people who are emigrating. They're leaving. They're, they're going out. Uh, and then migration is that general term which is ambiguous. So just remember that. When we often talk, use that term, we could be referring to net migration which is when you know we subtract the people who come in and the people who leave we have a net term or we could be talking about emigration or immigration so remember that unless that word net is in front of migration this is the more ambiguous word uh, immigration emigration or migration however we we want to refer to it is a process both a process and an event so professor hiskey illustrated how intentions to leave start back in the origin, and that's the beginning of the process. And the process then continues after you actually cross the border or come in in whatever way you do come in. And uh, oftentimes that process continues for several generations. Uh, so it is both a process and an event. And just to give you an idea of numbers, um, I am going to show other numbers as well, but the United States formally accepts, meaning authorized, legally accepts into the country. It's been averaging about a million uh, people. These are, uh, that's an annual number. It's been averaging about around a million people for since 2000 or so. And that, however, does not include the unauthorized. And this is a number of people coming in it's not a number that refers to all foreign born in the US, which is much larger than that. All right, I'm sure um, Elliot Osment will speak a little bit more about visas and the, the legal ways of entering and the unauthorized ways of entering. But what my point here is that I wanna make sure that you understand that there are legal visas that allow you to enter for a short term or for a long term. You can be someone who is a, uh, uh, you know, part of a big multinational corporation. You come to the U.S. for two years or four months or three weeks. That's technically someone who is short term, um, a uh, temporary worker, agricultural worker. There are some visas that still exist for, for those workers, although most of them are unauthorized in the U.S. Um, uh, so there's all sorts of visas that you can come in to the U.S. and use um, uh, in theory. You have to be, of course, granted those visas um, uh, for a short period of time. And then there are visas that allow you to stay in the U.S. for long periods of time. Those are uh, employment-sponsored, family unification, refugees, all of those groups of people typically are, are, have legal permanent residency or they may eventually become naturalized citizens. When you're a legal permanent resident, you can live and work in the U.S. the way anyone who is U.S. born can. There is one thing you cannot do if you're a, a legal permanent resident. What is that? Vote. And if you're a naturalized citizen, let's say you're a legalized permanent resident for five years and you take the exam, and you swear, swear, you get sworn in and you become a naturalized citizen, what is it that you cannot do? Run for president. So um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was never able, has not been able to realize his dream 
uh, which he said many years ago that was his dream, was to run for president. That was before he was governor of California, so it may not, he may not feel that, that way now. Um, okay, so unauthorized or undocumented uh, persons are also people who come in uh, in different ways. And you can see there's largely speaking three broad ways. You can come in with legal status in, of some way and overstay your visa. Many foreign students, at least that used to be common for foreign students, now it's less common. You could cross uh, without any documents or you could, you know, you could enter in crossing over with fraudulent documents or um, or no documents, and that can happen in an airline, you know, through an airport. It can happen uh, across a physical border. Um, uh, or you could enter with authorization but work without it. So usually when we talk about unauthorized or undocumented people, we're talking about all of these different sorts of people um, uh, there. So a uh, little bit of data. Now here we're only talking about permanent residents. So permanent immigrant admissions, permanent residents, nearly two-thirds of them, as you can see, are admitted on visas that are related, uh, where it, that suggest they have relatives in the U.S. So you can see family-sponsored visas, 22%. Then these shares, by the way, have not changed since 2001. I just checked them this morning. They're about the same. And 42% enter in as immediate relatives of uh, U.S. citizens. So two-thirds of everyone coming in legally, formally with the visa are coming in uh, related to people uh, already in the U.S. Um, uh, you can see that uh, uh, here shows you what the national origin is of immigrants. And you can see about 30 percent of all the foreign-born people in the United States are Mexican born um, and uh, again these these shares haven't changed much in the last couple of years these data reflect 2009 the Philippines 5% 4% are Indian another 4% Chinese Vietnam etc so these are the top 10 countries um, uh, of the foreign born population currently in the US and then you can see in the little square box we have top origins for refugees because refugees, as I said, are given permanent residence, right? But refugees typically are not from the same national origins as most immigrants, most foreign born in the US. Now, if there's one slide, one takeaway here, please, it is a, it, that you remember from yours truly. You don't need to remember my name. You don't need to remember what I look like. I could care less. What I care about is this slide. One takeaway, and that is that, oh my goodness, most people, foreign-born persons, are in the U.S. with authorization to be in the U.S. Check that out again. 28% of people in the U.S. who are foreign-born uh, are unauthorized. Everyone else is here in some authorized status. This is not what we would think about. This is not what we would uh, learn if we listen to the larger rhetoric in the media, uh, in, the, in the public sphere. So we have legal permanent residents, 30% or so, naturalized citizens, 37%, legal temporary migrants, and then you have this chunk. So less than one-third are persons who are unauthorized. And um, please, if you remember that, it would make me enormously happy. I'm going to go to my grave trying to get that fact out into the world, unless, of course, the rhetoric in the United States about immigration changes. Um, this is a map of the U.S., and these dots refer to the highest foreign-born population growth in the 2000s. Uh, and you can see a lot of green and yellow in the southeast. And that's where most of the growth has been in the foreign-born population, meaning those states have witnessed the fastest growing immigrant populations. Why is that a story? Well, it used to be there were only six fast-growing immigrant states in the United States. New York, where else? California, where else? 
Illinois, Texas, Florida, and New Jersey. Okay? And now, in fact, there are many states where the immigrant populations are growing much more rapidly. In part, this reflects, you know, economic development opportunities in the South. It reflects a lot of different dynamics um, uh, that explain why immigrants are moving here. Take a look around Nashville. Walk any block from campus, if not 10, if not 25, and you will see immigrants. Open your eyes. Immigrants are all over this city. Um, uh, in Nashville, so this is just a, uh, you know, a... Um, table that describes Nashville's immigrants and growth in the foreign-born population here in the city, in the metro area. And you can see there has been a doubling of the foreign-born populations of, of, from these national origins uh, for seven out of these ten national origins, right? When the percent change is 100% or more, the population is doubling and that's just in the first decade. And it's Mexico, of course. We know Mexico has been driving immigration to the U.S., although that has begun to change. Um, but it's El Salvador. It's India. It's Egypt. Uh, the Egypt is not a country that typically is um, uh, a country that we think is driving immigration, the immigration story in metropolitan areas. But here uh, it certainly is. Um, of the top metropolitan areas in the country, it's interesting that most of those metros in the southeast have what we call a balanced or higher immigrant skill ratio. What is that? It's simply the number of foreign-born, let's say, in Nashville or in Chattanooga, uh, who, are, um, have, who are skilled versus the number who are unskilled or l far less skilled, less than a high school degree. And so what you can see is that here in the southeast, despite, again, what the rhetoric would suggest that all immigrants are low-skilled, really, the rhetoric suggests, let's just get the elephant out in the room, okay? It suggests that all immigrants are low-skilled, all immigrants are Mexican, and all immigrants are illegal or unauthorized. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, what we're seeing here in the southeast is we're seeing a more balanced skill ratio in metropolitan areas. Look in Knoxville, you actually see that the skill ratio is high. That reflects the unique contribution of uh, the economy in, uh, 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 in Knoxville as well as the, the National Security Lab there. Okay, so that's all I have to say for the moment. Um, I will introduce Elliot Osman. Okay, um, can I move this uh, computer to make room for my notes? Because I don't have any slides for you folks today. Well, but you're up there. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> but I, my assignment to uh, discuss with you today is um, the history of immigration here in Nashville. And I spoke to someone coming through the door, and I said, and an illustrious history we have. Uh, just for a frame of reference, between 1990 and the year 2000, that decade, 400,000 immigrants moved to Nashville, Tennessee. That's a lot of people for a city that's not all that big. And... From 2000 until today, some people have been doing their best to drive every one of those immigrants out of Nashville, Tennessee. And so I'm going to talk to you today about four major developments that occurred uh, in the mid-2000s that were uh, attempts to drive immigration out of Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm going to tell you the story of how those attempts were fought and how eventually they were beaten because every single one of them failed. Uh, before I start on those four uh, major events, 
When you get back to your room, I want you to Google immigration in Nashville. And on the first Google page, at least when I Googled it, it had a 17-page article on that subject that appeared in a 2008 edition of Nation Magazine. It's very, very good. Get that and read it because that will give you an excellent background up to 2006. But what I'm going to talk to you today about is from 2008 on because that's the recent history of uh, immigration in Nashville. The first event, significant event that happened, was a, uh, an attempt to pass an English-only amendment to the Metro Charter. This was the creation of one of our councilmen, uh, Eric Crafton, who's no longer on the council, but he was recently appointed, get this, to the Tennessee Human Rights Commission by Lieutenant Governor Ron Ramsey. So we're still having to contend with him and his ilk in state government. But that was his brainchild, and it was heavily supported financially by an outfit called Pro English. And there was a referendum that was held, and it was beaten. Now, I could talk for an hour about the English-only proposition, but I only have 15 minutes. And so, suffice it to say, that was the first, the first battle that was fought against English-only. How was it beaten? It was beaten because some people worked very hard. This was a referendum. You had to go and vote whether or not to amend the Metro Charter. And the way it was beaten was to warn the people of Nashville that if they passed that amendment to the Charter, Metro government would be smothered with lawsuits. And my name was invoked more than once in those discussions. And you know what? It was true. I was already making my plans. Because if you don't translate for foreign speaking people that live here in a court, you have violated their due process. And so you better believe the lawsuits would have come. But the people of Nashville said, we don't want to see Osmond any more than necessary. And so they voted it down, which was fine with me. The second uh, big event that happened in Nashville <coughs> was um, a program called 287G. Now, that is a title uh, that comes out of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And what it provided was that ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the enforcement arm of the Department of Homeland Security could partner up with local jurisdictions, local sheriffs, and those sheriffs would sign a contract whereby they agreed to hold a person who was put into jail for any reason, didn't matter what the reason was, put into jail and then not not being able to post bond, and then being taken to court, a decision is made on their criminal, uh, their criminal case, and then 287G provided that the local sheriff got to keep that person in custody two, uh, two days, 48 hours, past the time they were eligible to be released from jail. So if they were found not guilty, they didn't walk out of the courtroom. They walked right back to the jail to wait for ICE to come and pick them up. Now, when that was signed, Sheriff Darren Hall uh, came to me and said, would you be willing to serve on the advisory panel? Well, yes, I would be, because I smelled a skunk, and I didn't want the sheriff 
to use that program and abuse immigrants. And so, yes, I said, I'll be on your uh, advisory committee. Now, I want to be sure of what you're intending to do. Who are you going to keep in jail on this 287G program? Oh, just the big criminals, you know, the killers and the dope peddlers and all the people that we want to get out of here. Now, of course, that's what all the enforcement people say. And so I said, okay, uh, I'll serve on your advisory panel. We'll see how it goes. Well, it didn't take very long, about two meetings into that advisory panel history, and I realized immediately what was going on. We had a chief of police in this city at that time who's not here any longer, and he turned the Metro Police Department loose on immigrants. If you were driving around with brown skin, you were a, a suspect for a stop. Didn't matter what you did. Uh, if you had your windows tinted too dark, you were stopped. And then you were asked for a license. Well, of course, Tennessee didn't give driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants by that time. And so, if they didn't have a driver's license, usually they used to just issue citations. But when 287G happened, off to jail they went. They were arrested for no driver's license. They were arrested for fishing in the park without a fishing license. Any slight infraction would land an immigrant in jail if they had brown skin. And so what was happening was very clear to me, it's called racial profiling. And so during these advisory committee meetings, I would raise my voice and I would say, this is abuse. What you're trying to do is racial genocide. You're trying to get rid of all the foreign born people here. And I'm going to fight it. I'm not going to be a part of this. Sheriff Hall then, well, I made one other comment. I said this advisory panel is a circus. And then, for some reason, he got mad at that and wrote me a letter and said, you're fired. I said, great, I'll see you in court. And so what happened was the problem with taking an immigration case, an immigrant case, and claiming that your constitutional rights have been violated <coughs> and your and uh, you've been the victim of racial profiling is, all of that has to be brought in immigration court. Well, I didn't want to bring those arguments in immigration court. I wanted to bring them in federal court, which is different. And so one day into my office walks a young man named Daniel Renteria. He was from Guatemala dark-skinned, just as dark as this young man sitting here in this blue shirt, handsome young man. He came in, but even though he was from Guatemala, he was not born in Guatemala. He was born in the United States. And when he was one year old, his parents moved to Guatemala and took him with them. Well, when he was 19 years old, he came up here. He came back to his homeland. But he still had brown skin. And so he was stopped, got into trouble, and they held him for several days. And then he walked into my office. And I said, thank God, you're an answer to my prayers. And we took his case. We filed a complaint, not in federal court, but in Chancery Court because we decided we would only sue Metro. Now, what was our argument? Our argument was that when Metro government was created back in 1963, there was a big dispute about what the sheriff could do and what the chief of police could do. And so the Charter Commission said, 
that they were going to strip the sheriff of all law enforcement authority in Davidson County only because we had formed a metro government. And so we didn't need the county sheriff to enforce the law anymore. We were going to put all law enforcement authority in the hands of the metro police and remove it from the sheriff's office. And that constant charter a provision went to the Tennessee Supreme Court. In 1964, there was a case called Metro v. Poe, Metropolitan Government of Nashville versus Richard Poe, who was the sheriff, and he sued. And the Tennessee Supreme Court at that time said, no, sir, that charter provision is good, it's legal for Nashville, and uh, we're stripping the sheriff of all law enforcement authority. Well, the problem was that there were three duties in that memorandum of agreement under that 287G program that made him exercise traditionally law enforcement powers. So our contention was it's a violation of the charter, and we sued Metro on that basis. Then Metro counters, or not countersued, but cross-claimed against the government, against the U.S. government, and brought the U.S. government into the case. Well, when they did that, the chancellor uh, said, oh, this is great. I can't hear this case because the U.S. is a party. And so then <laughs> it got transferred over to federal court. And then when it got to federal court, the federal court remanded the question up to the Tennessee Supreme Court, back over into state court, to decide the question of whether that charter provision about the sheriff was still applicable. Well, <clears throat> the Tennessee Supreme, Supreme Court decided against us. But you know what? Two weeks before that decision came down, I'm going to let you add your own math mathematics here. Two weeks before that decision came down, Sheriff Hall made an announcement that he was going to disband the 287G program. And then two weeks later, the Tennessee Supreme Court upheld uh, the 287G program, which had by that time been discontinued. But then in November, we had a charter amendment to give certain powers, law enforcement powers, back to the sheriff, just in case there was another, another troublemaker somewhere in Nashville, like Osmond, who'd come along and sue Metro again. But that's a case of where we uh, lost the battle, but we won the war. Now, very quickly, uh, a third major event <coughs> was the case of Juana Villegas, who was our client. <coughs> she was stopped for some racial profiling reason by a Berry Hill cop. And uh, she, of course, was arrested for no driver's license because she was undocumented. Uh, she happened to be very, very pregnant at the time. And so, no sooner than they arrested her and took her over to Metro Jail, which is where Berry Hill takes all of its prisoners, she started going into labor. <coughs> and Metro Jail, the sheriff, transported Juan of Villegas to Metro General Hospital. <coughs> and <coughs> the sheriff's deputies, while she laid in labor, handcuffed her to the bed because she was such a serious risk to public society. And then after she gave birth, they refused to give her a breast pump so she could get some relief from the pain she was suffering after birth. Well, that case came to us. We sued Metro got a $200,000 verdict from the jury. And then the Metro appealed it. We finally settled it for something like $600,000. That included attorney's fees. But the most important thing about that case was not what it cost Metro. 
most important thing about that case was we were able to get a federal judge to sign a U visa for Juana Villegas. She was the victim of a crime, or at least a victim of criminal behavior. No crime had ever been charged against the sheriff or his deputies. But the federal judge said there was criminal activity, conspiracy to defeat her civil rights. And so he signed her, her U visa, and when a federal judge signs a U visa, Immigration service is not going to buck that. So she got a U visa. Finally, the big raid that took place, there were lots of home raids here in Nashville, but the biggest one was at the Claremont Apartments, about a mile down the street from my office on Murfreesboro Road. And it was a team of ICE agents, Metro Police, private security, and representatives of the owners of the complex, the apartment complex, they all were together, or at least uh, agreed together, to permit ICE to go onto that property and to break into apartments. Break in the doors, break in the windows, and arrest everybody that had brown skin in those apartments. Well, we took about 12 of those people and made them plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit. We just settled that lawsuit. It was five years long. You got to fight long and hard, man, if you're going to get in immigration. And we finally settled that lawsuit two months ago. I can't tell you what the private parties paid, but I can tell you what Metro agreed to pay. Metro agreed to pay um, three hundred thousand uh, dollars I'm, I'm pardon me what well, ice agreed to pay three hundred thousand dollars Metro paid some sum but what ice did was they granted these plaintiffs uh, <clears throat> uh, they granted them deferred action for seven years unheard of nobody has ever been able to get that what is that that means you get an employment card for seven years. You get to work here legally for seven years. And if they apply for advanced parole, they can go home and visit their family and come back without any problems whatsoever. Guess what? There hadn't been any home raids in Nashville since. So those are the battles that we fought uh, about immigration here in Nashville. And what are we supposed to do now? Go over here and take questions? All right. We won't be, uh, we're not insulted if you only want to ask Elliot questions. We understand he's got a lot more interesting things to say or lots of detail, but uh, questions. Come on. I'm a college professor. I can stand up here for a long time. I'm sure someone's got something they're thinking about related to migration. Yes. Okay, uh, let me repeat the question. Yeah, are, are there any cases or any legislation that's pending currently uh, in the, uh, you know, at the city level or at the state level uh, that you're worried about that uh, could be anti-immigrant? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, there are no cases in our office that are pending that, are, uh, that would be considered anti-immigrant. Um, so... Right now, uh, things are calm. Uh, <coughs> of course, there are always fights to, to fight. Uh, and um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Now, as far as <coughs> immigration generally is concerned, you're probably aware of the fact that in November of last year, President Obama announced DAPA which is a companion to DACA, which he announced in June of 2012. Uh, DACA is for Dreamer students, students that were brought here at a young age 
and they've grown up here. They call America their home, but they didn't have any um, credentials, any documentation. And so DACA was designed <coughs> to give those people uh, documentation so they could <coughs> live a somewhat normal life here. Um, now, DAPA, the companion piece to that, was deferred action for parents of U.S. citizen children. That is, children born here in the United States from undocumented parents. And it was supposed to cover, it was intended to cover um, about 5 million people. Um, it was supposed to start operation in May of this year, but states, including the state of Tennessee, by the way, filed a case in a federal court in Brownsville, Texas, and got that judge to issue an injunction stopping the program. And so that's where we are. It's now under appeal at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Those of you that know the Fifth Circuit know that we don't expect much good to come out of there. Uh, and once they announce a decision, it will more than likely be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. We're hoping that that's what happens and that we'll see some action by the Supreme Court in spring, summer of 2016. Right, so that's, which may that's or may not, on. right? That timeline, that's what we're hoping for. That timeline may or may not be realized. And then we remember we have a change of president coming up that fall. So Now, what's, what's also significant about that is <clears throat> that that program is aimed at U.S. citizen children's parents. What some have said in the uh, presidential campaign that's presently going on, and I don't want to get into politics here, but you need to be aware of the fact that at least one of the candidates, and I think more than one, has indicated that he favors a program where you can deport the four and one half million U.S. citizen children that were born here in the United States. Let's deport them along with their undocumented parents. Do you realize how revolutionary that is? That's never been tried before. And we have a presidential campaign of a major presidential party advocating for that. Uh, it's absolutely scandalous and an outrage. And it should not be tolerated by any thinking people that have the freedom to vote and the responsibility to vote wisely. Other questions? There's got to be more than one out there. Come on, just produce one more question. Yes. <coughs> okay, so the question is, what is the solution? Uh, we could probably all weigh in, but uh, Elliot, you want to start? Well, I think a fundamental problem uh, responsible for <coughs> attitudes toward immigrants lies with the parents, especially parents here in the South. I don't think the South is over the Civil War yet. I think they're still mad at the blacks, and I think they're mad at anybody with a color of skin other than white. They're mad at anybody that doesn't speak, as they call it, American. And the reason they're like that is because their parents rose them to believe those things. And until we turn that around, especially here in the South, you're not going to get a solution to nativism, xenophobia, and the anti-immigrant fervor that's out here. Right now, and this is stretching all the way up into the White House. Now, those of you who know me know I'm a firm supporter of President Obama, but I'll tell you one of the worst mistakes he's ever made 
is his Central American policy that you referred to in your presentation. His advisors totally missed the mark. 80% of the people fleeing from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala are not just immigrants crossing the border. They are refugees. But they're not recognized as refugees. They're fleeing violence and gangs that are robbing their families, killing them if they don't pay ransom or pay tribute to the gangs. And you know what that problem started from? Back when Ronald Reagan was president, he gave TPS to a lot of people in El Salvador. Temporary protected status. Right. TPS. And, and that was because they were fighting communism. Any enemy of communism was a friend of Ronald Reagan. And so they came up here in droves, and they raised children, mainly in Los Angeles. But we didn't we didn't absorb those kids very well. They grew up in their own little pocket in Los Angeles. And guess what? As they grew up to be your age, they began to develop gangs. And so in 1996, we passed one of the worst immigration laws in the country, IRA IRA. Bill Clinton signed it. Republicans pushed it through. And what it provided was these people that were gang members and these people that were drug pushers, let's get them out of here. And so that's what we did. We got them out of here. And you know where we sent them? We sent them back to El Salvador. We exported our problem. And now those gangs have captured entire countries. El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. And you know who caused the problem? We did. But now, when good people are trying to flee those conditions down in Central America, what do we say? We say, get back home. We don't want you. You've just heard the wrong message down there in Central America. I say, shame on us. All right, that's enough for me. <laughs> John, do you want to follow that or no? no All right, another question? <laughs> Yeah, so the question is about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and what consequences might it have for international migration, broadly for immigration to the United States from anywhere in Asia, correct? Yeah. Anybody? You want me to answer that or somebody else? So, so <coughs> Hold it, yeah. Um, so, yeah, in Mexico, uh, you know, I mentioned those um, six or seven central western states were the primary centers of migrants historically from Mexico. Um, but I slipped in there that it's changed slightly over the past 10, 15 years. One of the reasons for the, that change is NAFTA. And <laughs> um, there we go. <laughs> I can sing now. Uh, so what we see is in, in southeastern Mexico, um, in particular, um, a, an increase in, in migration. And uh, many attribute part of that increase to the displacement of small farmers in Mexico, um, flooded by uh, agri-corporation um, uh, products from the US, uh, ironically with corn in particular, 
Um, and so we've seen a, a tremendous economic displacement take place in that part of the region, resulting in um, some migration from newer uh, other parts of Mexico that we had not seen before. So to the extent that that takes place with this agreement with uh, the uh, Asian Pacific uh, area, I would imagine we would see migrants, pro not refugees, um, but uh, uh, certainly a an increase in migrants, migrants. E economic migrants, yeah. Let me also say that when NAFTA was um, being constructed and negotiated for several years, um, uh, the, the people at the Department of uh, State that I knew uh, told me that they were explicitly told uh, to never discuss NAFTA in the same sentence as migration. So I don't know how the Trans-Pacific um, package is being negotiated, but the NAFTA was negotiated without any public, certainly, and who knows how much explicit discussion of migration. So when you talk about the movement of labor or the movement of capital, which is what these big trade agreements are typically moving around, um, you would think you would have a conversation about the movement of labor as well. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't. I think the future is going to tell here uh, about uh, about the answer to your question. Did you have a question? I think I saw your hand up before. birth certificates. Well, there's been some reporting about how in Texas uh, there are certain counties uh, that are uh, unwilling or putting various obstacles in place um, um, for families who are appear to be Mexican-born, although some may be from Central America, uh, but they're certainly foreign. Uh, born families and women in particular trying to get birth certificates for their children. And um, this is not, this is something that has happened periodically uh, in Texas and some other states in the last 20 years, but recently it's been discussed in Texas. There have been a number of journalistic reports here. And um, um, all I can say is that when I had my two children, I filled out a form while I was in the hospital, and the birth certificate arrived at my home. So any, anything other than what seemed to me, at least at that time, and I imagine still is normal procedure, um, uh, you know, certainly suggests to me a, uh, uh, you know, a problem with the rights of the, of the birth mom and, and the child born in the United States. I don't know legally, Elliot, I don't know if you know if there's anything legally, any legal cases about this, but certainly there are now enough anecdotes to suggest that certain counties are, um, are creating obstacles in this process. I'm not familiar with any specific county in Texas. If I understand your question, it is uh, certain counties in Texas are declining to issue birth certificates to children of un undocumented immigrants who were born in that county. Is that your, is that your question? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <clears throat> uh, there is a way around that. Um, and a good immigration attorney can lead them in the right direction. <coughs> there is a document you can file. It's very similar to a naturalization application. <coughs> it's about as complicated and as long. But it is an application for a certificate of citizenship. And what you do if the county... Uh, down there does not uh, issue a birth certificate that you can get a passport with. <coughs> you send an application for a certificate of citizenship documented by birth records in the hospital 
where the child was born, and you send that to immigration, not to the local county where uh, officials down there can be as corrupt as they can be, but you send it to immigration, and you fight your battle there. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that's a way around the local county that refuses to issue a birth certificate. Um, okay, I think we're at time. Uh, we'll be around for a couple of minutes. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you to Elliot for making the trip here. Thank you. <laughs>